um, these last two ideas, I want to try to summarize the big ideas here. One is called goodness of fit. The other one deals with something called contingency tables. Um, and I think I can summarize um, the ideas. Big picture is, let's do it like this. I'll, I'm going to kind of give you a summary of what two examples might look like. Um, and then I'll work through kind of the details on, on both of these. So for the goodness of fit, I'm hoping to give you an example in three minutes of what, what a goodness of fit looks like. So there's a, the problem that we're, the first problem that we're gonna work through, there's a geneticist and who's working with fruit flies. And this geneticist expects these different types of fruit flies, right? There are four species. And so with those four species, if you go out into the real world, what he expects to see, if he starts gathering the fruit flies, is that of those four, species one, category one, he expects one sixteenth of them um, to appear if he were to, you know, if you split this up into proportions or ratios, he would expect these to be in these percentages or proportions, three sixteenths. So you could turn these into percentages, um, but he expects these to be in this ratio. Sometimes it's one to three to three and to nine. So that's not a four. And if you add those up, um, one and three is four plus three is seven plus nine is 16. But he expects those proportions, if you were to find them, to look like this. So that's proportion, let's call this one um, proportion A, proportion B, proportion C, I don't, we can call them anything, but he expects those fruit flies, fruit fly A, B, C, and D to it appear in those ratios. So if he gets A, he expects three times as much, three times as many of those fruit flies to appear. Um, for B and three times as many for C compared to A. And then for fruit fly D, he expects that number to be three times as much as he found in, a, in, a, you know, in fruit fly B. So those are the proportions that he expects. So that is what's expected. And what that means, right, if those are the ratios, um, if he had Let's say that there is a sample of 4,000 fruit flies. Given those ratios, he'd expect 1 16th of those to be of type A. He'd expect 3 16ths of those 4,000 to be of type B and C. And then nine sixteenths of those 3,000, 4,000, right? So there are numbers that he expects. These are expected values. And what we're going to do is take those theoretical expected values and compare them to something that's actually observed in the real world when he goes out and and, and sees if, if his expectations, if his expectations are met. So these are the expected values. And you'll see why this is called a goodness of fit. So those are expected values. Right, if there were 4,000. And what was observed were ratios and proportions that were different. 
So what he observed was 226, 764, 733, 2,277. So we have expected and we have observed. Is there a difference? Right? Is that difference significant? How well does the observed fit the proportions of what was expected? So goodness of fit, wellness of fit, right? I don't know about goodness, but that's that's what we call it. It's a GLF goodness of fit test. So now, how well they fit is, is, is the question. That would be a goodness of fit test. It's just pretty simple. You have expected proportions. You get some observed proportions or values. And I'll talk about how we measure um, those values. So that is the first thing that we're going to look at. And then, and I'll do one example there. I hope that idea makes sense. We just have two numbers, two lists of numbers, and we wanna find out whether or not that difference is significant. Um, then there is another, another type of, uh, where, where we're working with these tables, these, these, these two different lists of things expected and things observed. Um, this problem, the second one that we're going to look at is contingency. Um, so let's, let's explain that. I think this example might explain this a little bit better. And these, they, they will also deal with um, expected versus observed. So for contingency tables, instead of dealing with fruit flies, I'm going to show another example here for contingency tables. So for this one here, um, this one comes from your book and it asks the question um, about a type of natural supplement, echinacea. And the question is whether or not echinacea has an, an effect on codes, right? So the coughing, sneezing, runny nose, can you take a natural remedy and will it make a difference? And so there are different, you know, potencies of, of, of echinacea. And so, there, let's call that, if, if I gave you just a placebo, right? So I'm going to say that there are different types or categories of potencies, A, B, and C. And A essentially is just nothing but a placebo. So there's, B is, we're going to say it has a 20% um, extract of ethanol. So, we'll, but it's a, it's, it's different from what we get from this other um, potency, which is a 60% extract. But the point is, is that there's A, B, and C. A's just a placebo. Then we have B and C. Um, and so we're going to look at a study that was done where, let's see if I can draw this up. And we have one, two, and three. And so, infected, some were infected, some were not infected by um, this virus. So 
there's the placebo. That's a treatment. So commonly, we're going to look at treatments in this top row. And we're going to see what the outcome is, whether or not um, the folks that were there got infected or not. And then there's this 20% extract. So, and I'm hesitant to, you know, I could use, the, I could say 20% extract, or I could just simply say type, you know, this is the B treatment. So we have the A treatment, the B treatment, and then we have the C treatment. And I'm, you know, the, the, the number is 20% and 60%. I wanna be careful that you don't get confused with those numbers, but those, we have three different treatments. Some people got infected um, and some did not. So those that took the placebo, there were 88 that were infected that took the placebo versus 48 who had treatment B versus 42. So more people got infected who only took the placebo versus those who had treatment B or C. How many did not get infected? So if we look at those numbers of those who took the placebo, there were 15 that did not get infected. And then there were some number that did not get infected who took treat, who had uh, underwent treatments A or treatments B and C. So these, are observed values. And the, the element that we want to get into is, well, what was expected? And so this one is going to look a, quite a bit different than just simply the two lists that we saw before for expected and observed. We're dealing with tables. And um, so we're gonna jump, get a bit into, into matrices for this one. Um, and I suppose the bigger challenge is coming up with those, those numbers. And I'll, and I'll talk about that. Um, so there are values that are expected, and that's the part that I want to dig into. There are numbers here. I don't want to jump too deeply into that, but those are the contingency tables, and I'll kind of give you a, a peek at some of the numbers that are expected and how they're calculated. So let's just at least present some, some numbers. So I'm going to save the leap to how these numbers are calculated for just a few minutes. So let's just stop for a second. So we have observed and we have expected. What's the difference between the goodness of fit versus the contingency tables, right? So we have those over there that are the goodness of fit versus looking at a treatment to see if, um, if, if, if it actually um, Im improves or affects these, these variables, right? If it affects, right? is there a relationship actually between the treatment versus the, um, the outcome? So does the, um, does whether or not you're infected or not infected, is it contingent upon the treatment? So is this right here contingent upon this variable? It's a contingency table. So that's the big difference with, right? 
So that's a contingency table. We're applying a treatment and we wanna know if the outcome is contingent or depends or related to the treatment. So it could be in a study, um, we're using this contingency table to look at um, a vaccine. And we're looking to see who gets infected and who does not get infected. And some of us get the placebo, some of us get a certain potency, and then there's another potency. So for the Johnson & Johnson, for example, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, um, I participated in that study and I thought that I had the vaccine, but in fact, they gave me the placebo. And the placebo was pretty convincing. I felt flu-like symptoms in my mind. I felt tired. I was convinced that I had the vaccine, but you know, apparently they, they told me that I didn't. So I certainly ended up going out later to get the, uh, uh, the vaccine. But placebo, um, and then various potencies, and then trying to determine if the vaccine, if you end up infected or not, how many end up infected or not, and you look at what's observed, and then the big question mark is, where do these expected numbers come from? How do we determine the 88.57, the 44, the 44.715, and so forth? So those two um, summarize kind of, you know, there's a treatment and we want to see if one row depends on the, um, if, if the row depends on the column, or I guess if the column depends on the row, however you want to look at it, if the treatment um, has any impact on the outcome. So that's the big idea. That's a contingency table. And technology simply allows us to plug these values in and get p-values. But let's talk about where that's coming from. Um, this first one, uh, the one that we're looking at here, let's say the, uh, I'll stop there. I'll stop there and, and ask and see if there are any questions. So that's the big idea. Goodness of fit. How well does a one pattern or one distribution ex meet what's observed? So you may expect one list of values to have a certain distribution. And we can test to see if those proportions of those distributions are the same. That's, that's different than treatment and um, an outcome and contingency and so forth. But both of those use the same terminology of expected minus observed. All right, so, and we can do some really incredible statistics with, with this information, with these two different uh, approaches. So for both of these, for both of these, um, you will come up with a test. Well, this is how we're gonna start. You're gonna come up with a test statistic for both of them. And that test statistic is going to be very similar to what we've seen so far, where you have a certain critical value And then you're looking to see if your critical, if your test statistic is beyond that critical value. This curve will have a different shape for both of these. Since we end up looking at the differences between squared and observed, subtracting them and squaring them, um, that's part of the reason that we call this a, a chi-squared test statistic. 
So that is our test statistic. This is a chi-squared distribution. I know the terminology is, is kind of weird. Even the symbolism is weird. But what it amounts to with our, it's not a normal distribution. It's not a T distribution. It has a, a different shape. So if I were to go out into this world, grab 4,000 fruit flies, look at the observed values, minus the expected and then go do it again, observed minus expected, I get a, if I were to repeatedly go in and look at those differences, square them and sum them up, right? So if I do this where I'm const, where I do it repeatedly, you'll see that there's a pattern where I take all of the observed values. So 226 minus 250, 764 minus 750, 733 minus 750, if I take each one of those observed, subtract the expected, square them, divide it by the expected, each time I do that, I'll get a single dot plot, a single point. Go repeat, I may get another point. Repeat the experiment, repeat the experiment. If I were to repeatedly kind of do this, those differences, right, where it's observed minus the expected, 226 minus the 250, observed minus expected, squared, observed minus expected, squared, observed minus expected, right? If you repeatedly do that, and then take the summation of those values, you end up with a particular distribution. Notice that whenever you take two values and square, and take the difference and square them, there's no way you're going to get a zero. I mean, you're not going to, you're not going to get a negative value out of that. So you will always, the smallest value that this chi-squared statistic can be, the smallest it can be is zero. That means observed is exactly the same as expected. The smallest you can get is zero. So our chi-squared statistic, or our chi-squared distribution is zero. And so we're looking to see how far from zero, how far those differences are between observed and expected. Now, the, there's a point at which it becomes improbable, right? And this is going to be our, our confidence level. If we get so far away from zero, um, maybe it's, right? If we get far enough away, it becomes improbable. So we can generate our test statistic and determine if we're over here. This is our test statistic. And let me just call it our test statistic. Right? If we're over here, we're in the rejection region. So this curve is a really good starting point for helping us think about what we're trying to do. We're just trying to you know, for these observed minus expected, these chi-squared things where we take the difference and square them, um, those will follow this distribution that's not a bell curve or Gaussian, right? A normal distribution. It is this other distribution that involves, and, and it changes based on the number of elements. So we have to, we're gonna have to talk about degrees of freedom. So that's the big idea. Are two things contingent? Like is the outcome contingent upon the treatment? Contingency tables. And then the other thing is there are two lists. Does the observed match what was expected? And so we're going to put these or form the, a, a, a hypothesis test of sorts. Um, and so for, let's say the fruit flies. Professor? Yes. What is the denominator under the chi-squared formula? Um, oh, good question. 
a, a mess. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't make it out. <laughs> I can't make it out either, but I know that it should be this here. And so observed minus expected, all over expected. Okay, thank you. Yes, thank you for asking. So now, how do we formulate our hypothesis test? Um, so for this, for the contingency, well, either the infection is impacted by the treatment or it's not. So let's write it like this then. For contingency tables, well, is the outcome contingent upon the treatment? So our null hypothesis and alternative would look like this, um, getting an infection um, is independent of the treatment and getting an infection um, and the treatment are dependent. So let's write that. This R dependent contingent. So what we're really so how do you so let's generalize so that we can do this with any getting an infection. So those two items infected or not is independent of the treatment. Those are the treatments. So I want us to be able to look at any table and then figure out how to put this into um, two statements. Is this guy over here independent of the, 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 the right? I was gonna say the, the, the gods above that are controlling the treatment, the intervention, whatever it is, right? So you, we want to be able to replace this. This is a nice, broad, general statement because it, it, regardless of the treatment, whether it's for a vaccine, right, or whether it's for some other type of intervention. Um, I think if I can bring up a module we do discuss. So what I want to do is also show you then what the hypothesis um, is, what the null hypothesis and the alternative hypothesis is for um, not just the, all right, I want to show you what it is for the goodness of fit. Let me see if I can one other thing. So this is a pretty powerful tool that we're looking at. And some of this is summarized. So if you were to look at this in your module, I'll, I'll just drop the link there. So what I'm showing here is in the module regarding echinacea, and it's also the same thing that's in your book. Um, so here are the other types of things that we could look at, um, whether or not certain tooth restoration materials um, result in health problems, right? There are certain types of um, tooth composites, tooth restoration materials that contain mercury. So there are certain disorders that result 
from these two different um, materials that are used for, for dental work. So this would be considered the treatment, right? And these are um, the outcomes. So in this case, this is, we're talking about contingency tables. Do, this, do the sensory, like, you know, the love, do the sensory disorders, are they affected? Are they independent rather? Are they contingent upon the materials? So your H0, your null hypothesis is that they're not, that these disorders are independent of the treatment of, or the, 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 um, the restoration materials. Sensory disorders are independent of the restoration materials that go into our teeth. Let's follow that same pattern. I'll stop this and clear it. Does it make a difference if you plead guilty or not? Um, does it, does it, are you more likely to get um, sent to prison? So again, this is contingency. We're not looking at goodness of fit. There's not one list and another list, and we're just looking to see what those differences are. This is contingency. So does it matter? Is, you know, the, the null hypothesis is that being sent to prison is independent. There's no connection between the two. The alternative is that being sent to prison or not um, is, and whether or not you plead guilty are dependent upon one another. So the null hypothesis is always that there's no contingency, no dependence. The null hypothesis is that there's no dependence. Um, that those two row items are independent of the two column names. So and then it becomes a matter of, you know, in, in, of rewording this, if we can get that general pattern. Is the vaccine, um, effective. The null hypothesis is that getting the treatment is independent, right? Receiving the treatment is independent of, um, of whether or not you ended up with the flu. Like those two items are independent or, or not, they are dependent. So these are examples that are worked through your book. So those um, are observations. And we're talking about contingencies right now. The, so the, the part that we need to get to, if hopefully before we finish up here, is that these are just simply observations, right? But the part we want to get to is, well, what was, what's expected? These are observations. These are observations. What's expected? And so we can get to these expected values by, by getting some totals over here out on the end and getting some other totals at the bottom of the columns. And we'll use that information to come up with expected values over here. And then once we have that, we're going to take an observed minus expected and then divide it by the expected value plus an observe minus the expected Right? So there's going to be a summation all over this other expected value. And we're going to get a summation and come up with a test statistic. Our calculator will also allow us just simply to put those numbers in and it will generate the test statistic for us.
So, um, questions. The only thing that's, well, the, the big thing that's missing right now is figuring out the degrees of freedom. That's not a big deal. Um, and then also figuring out for contingency tables, how do we get the expected values? And then also for goodness of fit, the expected and the observed, we're going to see how to put those into different lists and get the test statistic for those. So I hope you see the patterns in this game that we're playing that they're very similar to what we've seen in the other parts um, in the other hypothesis tests that we've done. Um, what I will do is work through this manually one time um, and then get the use technology to, to help us answer this question. So we need to figure out what that critical value is. Now, our degrees of freedom that we use for this chi-squared test, we're going to use the number of classes or categories. And then this is, we're talking about goodness of fit. It's going to be the number of categories, minus one. And when we talk about contingency tables, contingency tables, it's going to be the number of rows, minus one, times the number of columns, minus one, and it's going to be the product of those. So there, there's a difference in, in determining the degrees of freedom, and that's probably the, that's certainly important. But we're going to use that the same table. And I'm going to see if I can bring up that table from the trio of stats. So let's we're setting up this test. We have a value. Um, I think this one showed alpha equals 0 0.05. What I'm going to do is not use 0 0.05, I'll use 0 0.10. So here's my question first. This is my rubric, just like all of these other critical value tests. And we can also get a p-value from this. I know that my critical value for um, goodness of fit test that we're going to look at right now first, this critical value is going to come from um, these two numbers, the point one. So a 10% confidence level. And there are two numbers that we need. We also need the degrees of freedom. So this is goodness of fit that we're looking at. And I'm dealing with expected and observed, fruit flies. And so there are two numbers that we we're going to need, the alpha level. And then the second thing is the degrees of freedom. The degrees of freedom, how many, we had four different proportions, one, two, three, four. And so the degrees of freedom. So with those two values right there, I have to go in and figure out what the critical value is. So here we have expected, we have observed what I, and the, we want to know if they're different. So either the proportions are all the same, or if they're not all the same, at least one is different. So we have these proportions, and let's do this here. Either they're all the same, portion A equals the given um, 
percentage A or percentage B or proportion A, right? Either they're all the same or at least one is different. Um, 3 sixteenths proportion for C or the would be 3 sixteenths. And then for the last one, we said that one was A, B, C, D, 9 sixteenths. And then the alternative, if they're not all the same, one could be wildly different. Um, and that's enough because if we're doing a difference between these two values, expected minus observed, and if one is wildly different, um, then we're going to end up squaring that difference. And that's going to blow us way past that chi-square statistic. So small chi-square test statistic values indicate that expected and observed, there's not a huge difference. So the alternative of, um, of the proportions being these, right, and, our, and what we um, observe is that at least one of the above proportions is wrong or different. So that's our hypothesis test. We have proportions and, and we can generalize this to, you know, to other observations, but um, does it fit the pattern? or the distribution, right? Does what's observed match what was expected? So let's continue on with the fruit flies. We have chi-squared. Let's go to our table and come up with the value and then let's go through the calculations. So the chat window, it might be worth it. Even though I know I've shared this at a number of occasions, I'm going to share this once again, just to make sure that it's in front of you. Triola stats, formula tables, drop it in the chat. Okay, there. So that's in the chat. So if I... To the, I think it's the very last page, we see that there is this table. So for the given degrees of freedom, I want to know, and also the particular alpha level, so the point 0.1 and the 3 are the numbers that we're looking at, point 0.1 and 3. So we have three degrees of freedom. And then this says area to the right of the critical value, right? Our chi-squared distribution looks like this. Alpha equals 0 0.1. And that's our critical region where we will reject the null hypothesis and we're trying to figure out that critical value. We need two inputs, degrees of freedom one, and then alpha two. So the area to the right is alpha, so we're good. Um, and it's always gonna be given that way. And there's alpha. With those two values, we now have our critical value of 6.251. So now, we have our critical value, 6.251. Let's clear that. And I'm going to get rid of that. 6.251 is this value right here. So I'm left with one task. I just need to figure out what the summation is 
observe minus expected squared over expected observe minus expected squared over expected and whatever that value is that's enough for me now to make a decision um, around this hypothesis test and we would be done then with that um, goodness of fit test So if I do it manually, um, what was the observed? What was it? It was 226 is observed. What's expected is 250. And then 764 minus 750. So let me quickly see if I can get my test statistic of the observed minus the expected value squared all over the expected values. And so that's going to be the 226 minus 250 all over 250, but square the numerator. Um, the next observed was 764 minus 750 squared all over 750, two more values. equals the 733 minus the 750 squared all over 750. Last one. I think that is the 2277. 2277 is, was what was observed. We expected a different. So 2277 minus the 2250 squared all over the 2250. Um, doing that one by one, you can certainly do that. You can put it into an Excel spreadsheet. You can, and then I'll show you how to do it in your calculator, but you can, if you run through those numbers, you should get a test statistic that we can use to make a decision. So our test statistic is um, 3.27. So we're largely done. We have to compare that to our critical value. And since we're not in the critical region, right? Since 3.27 is less than the critical value of 6.251, it's not enough in the mud for us to reject the null hypothesis. It's not enough in the rejection region. So um, what we'll say then is um, at the alpha equals 0 0.10 level, um, the claim should not be rejected. So the claim that the proportions are this right here, the claim that the proportions are the are these ratios that were listed, we're going to accept it. There's not enough evidence to, to reject it. So though the fact that there are differences, those differences aren't big enough for us to reject the idea. So at the 0 0.10 level, um, go back and look at the null hypothesis and state it here. You can say the null hypothesis um, should not be rejected, but it, it, we wanna talk about this in terms of the original statement, the, uh, the geneticist, the geneticist claim. should not be rejected. <laughs> 
So that is our critical value test. But don't forget, just like before, we, there is also a p-value. So what's the probability of being that far away from zero? Well, we can use a feature in our calculator. CDF, once again, will give us the area um, under a curve. We just need to go from left to right. So we had three point, you know, there was a critical value, but we're over here. What's the likelihood of being as far away from zero as we are? So we're going to go 3.27 all the way out to infinity. So 3.27 all the way out. I'll just use a large number. And then the degrees of freedom must be put in. So there's the left or the starting point. So the left boundary, the right boundary and the degrees of freedom for this was the number of categories minus one. Number of categories minus one and this is for the goodness of fit. And so this value, um, we're, we're going to compare this to, to alpha. Uh, and so if I try to drop those numbers into my calculator, if I go under distributions um, and look for a chi-squared CDF, drop down to here, I get my 3.27 all the way out to nine degrees of freedom of three. And we get a 35. So there's a 35% chance of getting those values that we that we did of being that far away from or getting that test statistic. So that's 0 0.35. I'll just round off and keep the numbers simple. And that value is greater than alpha. So it, it would be the same statement, but you would fail to reject, but put it into a plain, a plain sentence. So we've done this two different ways. We did it the critical value way. And we did it this other method, this other process by using, you know, that critical value to generate um, a p-value. One last thing here. I think um, if I clear this, let's see if we can use our calculator to help us. I'm going to go back in and generate or drop in those numbers as two lists. And I'll have maybe the observed in one list. And then I'll place the expected in list two. So observed in list one. Make sure the numbers look correct. So I have the observed in list one and the expected in list two. So I want to do a hypothesis test here. So I'm going to click stat, move over to tests, and I'm going to drop all the way down. So this is a goodness of fit test. Do the proportions fit? Do the patterns match? That's D. The chi-square test is um, the contingency. Does one contend, is one, uh, set of variables contingent? Are they interrelated? So I'm not going to do C, which is chi-squared test. I'm going to do the goodness of fit. And I said the observed is going to be list one. And the expected is list two. And I'm going to maybe just hit draw 
if I select draw, it draws the chi-squared and it shows me what that test statistic generates. And what you may have a hard time seeing is the p-value in the test statistic, but it shows the consistency in the numbers. So what I'm going to do is just not draw and just select calculate so that you can see this better. So I'll go back to test and do my goodness of fit test and just select calculate. And so we have the 3.27 for the test statistic. And then we also have the degrees of freedom well, that's there, but the, the chi-squared is 3.27 and the p-value is the 35%. So all that work that we did with the subtraction between observed and expected divided, all of that gets calculated for you and the p-value gets calculated for you. So the result of this chi-squared GOF goodness of fit test is that it will end up giving you um, both of those, the test uh, statistic and the p-value allowing you to make a decision. Questions? So I should be able to give you information about what was observed versus what was expected. Um, and then from those two lists, you should be able to generate a test statistic and make a decision. Um, as to whether or not you reject or fail to reject the null hypothesis. And you will also need to be able to go in and get the critical value for your test. And again, I do love a picture. It just helps me think about it and structure my thinking. Um, given the time that we have left what i'll do is i'll share more about how this table is generated for the expected values that's kind of the meat of this particular um you know when we're dealing with contingency tables um, but let me go ahead and, and work through um the problem here so these values and these values that we have here for the expected, I, I haven't shown you yet, and we have a limit, and I'll, I'll have to show you in, in, a separate, in a separate video that's sent along. But I do have expected values, 88.57. I know that this might not be so easy to see. So 88.57. And I realized that in the last few minutes, I'm skipping this one part. And we'll, again, I'll show that, show where we generate that later. 44.715, um, 14.430. Seven point two eight five. <clears throat> um, each one of those expected values, like for row one, column one, is coming from the totals that we would get here: the one seventy eight and the twenty nine, one hundred three, fifty two and 52, they're coming from looking at the two values here. Um, and then, so the formula looks something like this, it's 163, one times 178, all over the big number, 207. And if you worked through that, you would end up with their 88.57. Again, I wanna share some of the thinking behind this. 
this one here, the 44.175, we're going to do the same thing. We're going to use the two end values that match up to get the expected value. And we'll do the same for each one of these. Use the two end values that match up to get the expected value. So you take those two end values. So for the 44.715, um, it would be 52. And then the 178 all over the total. And that's going to give us the 44.715. Um, but assuming that we can get the observed, well, the, the observed is given, that's what we've seen. Assuming that we can get the expected values and that more insight can be added later, what can we do with this? Well, this, we're going to go ahead and do pretty much what we've just did. We're going to Test the hypothesis. Does the treatment matter? And we're going to draw the curve of the chi-squared test. And we're going to figure out what that critical value is and what, where that rejection region lies. Um, and then we're going to develop our test statistic. This is our critical value here that we want to come up with. And we're just going to compare our test statistic um, by taking one, two, three, four, five, six differences, each of them squared, divided by expected values. So that one's a bit of work, but it's going to be observed minus expected all over and square that all over not all over individually observed minus expected over expected and then add that so that one is a bit of work but let's let's come up with the critical value before we start talking about the, the work that needs to be done this chi squared value this critical value is going to come from degrees of freedom once again and alpha the degrees of freedom for this one is going to be it's defined as the row size and the column size both of those are take one from them so since we have um, two rows and we have three columns we have one times two. So our degrees of freedom for this one is two. So our critical value in our table is going to be, um, there's a two and then there is, um, let's say that this is alpha equals 0 0.05. So two and 0 0.05, if we go into our table and use the two, and the 0 0.05, we end up with this value of 5.991. So our critical value based on the degrees of freedom in alpha is 5.991. Um, and we need to go ahead then and figure out what the summation of each one of those values, um, what the summation of those values are. If, and that's, and your calculator certainly will help you go through that. Um, there is a, and that's what I'll have to save. I'll save that, but for now, what you should see is take the 
observe, let me just do a couple of these values. Observed, 88. Minus expected, 88.57. Square it, divide it by the expected. So just like before, you'll be able to put these into, but instead of working with lists, we're going to work with matrices. And that's the component that's going to need to be demonstrated. So there's that one. We have another observed minus expected that comes after that. What is that? The 48, 44.715. There's a four, oops. There's a 48. And there's a 44, 48, and a 44. So we're going to do that for each of those matching cells um, just one time. After that, I would hope that you would use the calculator. So observed minus the expected, 44.715 all over the expected, 44.7. Five. <clears throat> um, and we're going to have one, two, three, four, five, six of those values. So that is the long way. And you'd come up with a two point, let's say plus dot, 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 give me, give you the ellipsis. And you, you should come up 2.925 and that test statistic that we just came up with is over here. And 2.925 is less than our critical value. And so we're going to reject, or in fact, um, not reject. It appears that getting an infection is independent of treatment. So getting an infection is independent of the treatment. Treatment doesn't, doesn't help much. Let's go back and look. Remember, 2.925, not enough evidence to reject. So if I'm not going to reject, I have to go back in and, and embrace that in some sense. So I'm going to circle it as I like to do. And just write the result as a rewording of this in some sense, or just take it as it is. It appears that getting an infection is independent and it's not contingent of the treatment. So the only two things that are left is how do you use your calculator to do this? And um, how do we get the expected values? And those will certainly have to come from the um, a video that comes after, a short video that comes after. But that test that we just did is a chi-squared test. It is C. And we have observed minus expected values. But those values, um, they are in matrices. We don't have lists, but we have matrices. And given that we have those two, we'll be able to just have your calculator do the work for us. But first, we have to populate the matrices. Um, and so you're, you're going to have to go down to second matrix, indicate what's inside, oops, second matrix, and then populate it. So you have to go in and edit A, put in the correct values. So it's a two by three. And populate it with those numbers, the 88, 
the 48, 42, 15, 4, and 10. And then you're going to have to do the same. Um, so if I go back to matrix, so let me get out of this matrix, go back to edit, drop down to B. This will be your expected. Make sure it's two by three. Um, 88.57, So I have my observed and expected values. I'm gonna do the work. Yeah, I'll use the calculator to help us do the work. So let me get out of this second quit. I think those values are correct. No, they're not. If I go back to this one, 88.57, I think they're correct now. Let's see if we get the same values. I'm gonna do second quit. I'll go to stats, tests, and I'm going to not do a goodness of fit. Now I'm doing this contingency um, test. So let's do C. I have observed. I also have the expected. I'm going to have it calculate the values. And if I didn't, so I'll have to check the numbers and be sure that I put them in correctly, but that's the basic idea. So I'll double check these numbers. There's something that, that's different, but that's the idea. All right, so that's the basic idea. I just need to share with you how to calculate the expected values.